Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of the Spy Point podcast. Trent Marsh here with Spy Point. Uh, joined today you know, with, with spring, if it hasn't arrived yet, just around the corner, thought it would be good to talk to somebody from the NWTF, and there's plenty to talk to with NWTF right now. So we've got Mark Hatfield, the National Director of Conservation Services, with us on this episode of the podcast. Pleasure to have you here, Mark. Appreciate you jumping on. Uh, tell us a, a little bit about your background and... Uh, and what it is you do with NWTF. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having us on and having me on to represent NWTF. Um, so as you said, my name is Mark Hatfield, National Director of Conservation Services. Um, so my job within NWTF is to really provide kind of, <clears throat> kind of strategic direction within the conservation department, uh, provide support for all aspects of the mission, both on the conservation side of things and the hunting heritage side of the mission. So I work hand in hand with all of our staff, our three coordinators, wildlife biologists, foresters, to really deliver the mission across the country. And so a little bit about myself. Um, I, I'm in, I live in South Carolina, Edfield, South Carolina, where our national office is. I did not grow up in South Carolina. I'm from Kentucky originally, and I've been down here for the past 18 years um, in one capacity or the other with the NWTF. And so when you say spring is in the air, I can tell you that it, spring is in the air here in South Carolina. The birds are, you know, they're they're probably starting to, you know, to really get out and, and show off a little bit. And, you know, hopefully we'll have a great spring. We uh, we aren't quite uh, to that point in northeast Indiana yet, but uh, <clears throat> snow's snow's starting to disappear. Birds are starting to be more visible just as you're out driving around the country. And that's that's always nice to see. And uh now, like I said, spring's in the air, and, and for NWTF, I'm sure, you know, we're on the backside of the convention now. It sounds like the convention went really well. I think people were really excited to kind of get back out and start doing stuff again. So how uh, tell us a little bit about how it was convention attended and, and what was general reception of the folks that attended the, the NWTF there in Nashville. Yeah, so it was really good to be back in Nashville this year. Uh, of course, we were at our virtual convention last year, but we had a great showing. Um, we were a little over, we were about 52,000 participants this year that walked through the sports show. Uh, that is down from our historical high back in 2020, but man, with everything that's going on and everybody's personal and professional life and dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're, we're ecstatic and, and it was, it was great to be back in Nashville with that. We had a lot of, you know, a lot of things going on, Grand National Calling Contest, we had auctions, we had great fundraising, we had a uh, a lot of representation from state wildlife agency there. It's kind of working in concert with us. So, man, it's just a big family reunion. We were just glad to see everybody and, and uh, you know, appreciate all the support that they gave us. It's great to, it's great to hear, you know, getting, you know, obviously we had the ATA and the the SHOT Show trade shows back in person this mm -hmm. year. And, and that was great. And it's timing. It always ends up, I'm never able to make it to NWTF for, for a lot of different reasons, but it's, it's certainly something I want to get to. Cause like you said, it's, it's a reunion and there's a lot of folks that I know that are there every year and it'd be, it'd be good to get down there and see them. So I, I need to make that a priority, but uh, good. Yeah, glad. you should. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it's we had over 400 vendors in our sports show. Uh, Mossy Oak was our you know maiden sponsor, but yep. I mean, we couldn't do it without all those guys. And so it was, man, it was it's tiring. All of our staff are tired. You know, we're all coming off to the heels of being in Nashville for the week, but man, it it was a uh, man. It really charges everybody up. Well, and I, I don't know how you guys were at NWTF, but ATA and SHOT Show, you know, you get you get your routines and you kind of know how it goes. And then we take a year off and and I, I kind of felt like I got out of practice. Like I was didn't carry enough business cards or didn't throw this in the bag. Or yeah. man, I should have brought it, it was this. Definitely, and, <laughs> you're exactly right. It was like it was amazing just that one year hiatus was like, what are we doing? How do we do this? And so uh -huh. it was Feel like rookies but man, again. it was it was. I mean, we kind of reset. This was my 19th convention. And so it was uh, it was probably by far the most stressful going into it because we were uh, we just didn't know what to expect. Yeah. But man, we had members, volunteers, partners. They came out in just busloads. And man, it was awesome. Fantastic. Again, just could not be happier to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
One, one thing that did come out of, of the convention, it's actually was the initial reason that I had reached out was uh, you guys announced the Help the Yelp uh, initiative or the Help the Yelp mm -hmm. campaign uh, and wanted to wanted to have somebody on to, to talk about exactly what the goals are behind that, how how hunters and, and landowners and conservationists can get behind it. What 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 are we you know, tell us a little bit about what Help the Yelp is and then the role that we can play in Help the Yelp. Yeah, so Help the Yelp, the Help the Yelp project um, is really just our our effort as an organization to really get out in front of some of the noise noise within the system when it comes to the health of the wild turkey population. You know, I think everybody has seen turkey populations fluctuate there in Indiana where you're at, man, you had a bang up year last year with reproduction. <clears throat> but overall, we have seen the, the population decline over the past 15 years. We have seen um, areas where birds have become overabundant, which isn't healthy. We've seen birds in areas in the country where they've gone, you know, they're lower than what they have been. So what we wanted to do is to start driving individuals and in the awareness that the health of the wild turkey population is not what it has historically been. And so this Help the Elf campaign or, or project is going to do that. And it's really fourfold. We'd want to bring more awareness to the background noise and what influences wild turkey populations and then generate and garner more of our resources into those areas. And so more social awareness of what's going on. Secondly, it's to kind of bring all turkey hunters forward into support for this we can't start fractionalizing ourselves you know hunters turkey hunters you know we have you know we've seen turkey hunter numbers decline in the past years <clears throat> organizationally you know we're a membership organization so we need members so we can have a voice to ensure that we're protecting our hunting heritage and influencing conservation policy so we want to you know recruit and and, and recruit and and really activate 250,000 turkey hunters across the country in support of, you know, helping the turkey populations. We want to recruit two, 200 small businesses and 20 large businesses that will allocate funding or support into these areas as well. One of those areas being research. So Help the Yelp is to bring awareness what the turkey population and the health of the turkey population is um, to activate and engage 250,000 turkey hunters. Um, doesn't sound like a lot, but that's only about 10% of the turkey hunting population. And then to really provide an avenue for large and small businesses to engage in the mission of the organization. Great. Yeah, and and so how how has, I mean, obviously we're, we're only a few days into it at this point, but what's the response been so far to the to the project? It was really good. You know, we raised right at or just under $15,000 while at convention that was going to be dedicated to wild turkey research, you know, because research is going to be paramount moving forward to figure out how we do that. And really, you know, we've got a lot of receptivity between some other organizations, other uh, industry partners that are starting to get behind this. So we really just pulled the bandaid off, you know, the mm -hmm. past week. And so it's really only been floating out there for about a week, but it's been really positive. I think it's well balanced and but I do think it it really provides an opportunity for us to talk about that the, the the wild turkey population the health of the wild turkey population has diminished and so we need to figure out how we can address that and how we can improve that to make sure that we stay and we maintain stable populations. And when you talk about needing to recruit 250,000 hunters what is it that you're needing from those turkey hunters uh, to help support the project? What is it you're going to be asking of them? Yeah, so one is to, you know, one is to join the NWTF, you know, by we, by us having a larger membership base, we're able to influence policy, both on the hunting heritage and the conservation policy so much easier. Secondly, those membership dollars generate funding for our mission. And when we're spending over 90% of the funding raise, 90% of our funds go towards the mission of the organization we're really able to maximize and have a return on that investment. But the other thing that they can do is continually to support their state wildlife agencies because we can't, you know, they're under different pressures, they're under different 
you know, paradigms. And so we've got to make sure that we support their decisions and give them space to experiment or to adjust and adapt to where turkey populations are going because they're really trying to maximize our, our use of the resource, but we have to have social support to do that. So that's one of the big aspects. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so when, when we talk about from a, from a hunter's perspective and, and how just in, in general, they can broadly support our turkey populations, you know, the, I think, I think a lot of times people talk about land management or they talk about habitat management and it, they're really more often talking about deer and, and, you know, turkeys, turkeys and deer are similar in the fact that, you know, if, if you want to have a healthy turkey population on your property, you're going to need food, cover, water. They share those three things, but food, cover, and water mean different things for turkey than they do for deer. But I think a lot, yes, there's crossover, but I think a lot of people think if I'm managing for deer, you know, it's kind of a build it and they will come to situation for turkey. So what are some of those areas where, um, where just general thought process, folks might be missing the boat a little bit on how they're managing their land, um, maybe for deer, hoping that it's going to work out for turkey, but but turkey have that different need that aren't being met. Well, I think um, I equate it to when we sit down and we turkey hunt and we hear a gobbler and we, we make our stand and we're going to set up our decoys or we're going to you know position ourselves to harvest that bird. What are we looking for? We're looking for open understory. We're looking for lines of sight where we can see longer distances, which is really the opposite of, you know, when you think about deer, they, they can be in a little bit tighter, you know, brushier areas, areas than wild turkey can be. <clears throat> so I think that's one of the biggest differences. You can manage for turkeys and get deer but it's not exactly the opposite. It's, you can't manage for deer and always get turkeys. Get turkeys. You know, so open understories, they need uh, young, or I would say, you hear the term nesting and brooding habitat. What is that? Mm -hmm. That is cover that the birds can have overhead protection from avian predators, and they have ways to disperse quick access for thick kind of breaking up their horizontal and vertical kind of planes of planes of view. So, but they don't need that everywhere. You know, they need these open areas because their breeding is, you know, they're, they're supposed to be, the Tom is supposed to be sitting out there displaying and the hens go to him. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of flipped the script when it comes to turkey hunting is we're getting him to come to us. But ideally that he would like to be sitting out there in the open displaying visible and, and being seen by all the hens in this immediate area. And so they need those lines of sight and open, open pathways that are, you know, something that's easy to walk through. Gotcha. And that, so we talk about, you know, the nesting habitat and, you know, mm -hmm. clear understories, uh, you know, that's, that's great on one hand, but you know, how, how do, how do we support nesting, nesting habitat specifically for turkeys? Cause I know, you know, the, the nest rating from predators is a big problem. I, I know I've seen that uh, on some of the, the properties where we've had some trouble getting turkeys established here in, in my part of the state. And uh, so if I were wanting to improve the nesting habitat on a piece of property, what's, what's the couple of the big things I can do? So, you know, you probably hear, you know, I think everybody probably played checkers or chess. You see that checkerboard pattern of habitat you see the, you know, the blocks of different habitat and that's kind of the checkerboard pattern. And so if you can disperse your nesting habitat equally across the landscape, it lowers the potential impact predation could have on wild turkey nests and or poults because you're only gonna have so many birds on the landscape. And by spreading them out across a larger area, it gives them the greatest chance to pull off a hatch. If you have all your nesting habitat in one area of your farm or your piece of property, it does and can provide an easy way for the nest predators to, and they, know, they don't always go out searching for them, but they stumble across them. Mm -hmm. And so if you have populations of turkeys that are, you can have the same amount of 10 acres of nesting habitat on a hundred acres. And if it's spread out across a hundred acres, 
that's pretty good. But if you've got it all in one spot and it's only in a 10 acre block, that's not very healthy habitat or it's not stratified across the landscape. So the dispersion of it is probably equally as important as the amount of it. Uh, that, no, that makes good sense. You know, the, when, it's, when it's a target of opportunity like that, if the opportunities for the raccoons and the possums and the skunks are all in the same general location, it's not going to take them very long to, to figure that out and find the majority of those nests and really put a hurt on your recruitment for the next year. Yeah, but if it's across all of the habitat that you have, you still have the same number of predators right. on that landscape. They can't cover it all. Yeah. And, you know, and I think we as hunters recognize that turkeys are meant to be eaten. You know, they are, <laughs> they are prey. And, mm -hmm. and that's what they, that's the niche that they fit in the ecosystem. And they're supposed to be eaten. But we just want to carve off few more for us to eat right, than right. we do the predators. Right. But they are, they are built to be eaten. And the way and the, the structure of their timing of hatch and the way that they raise their broods, it minimizes the predation of them because it's supposed to flood the habitat with food. And then the predation and predators will only take a sliver of that. Mm -hmm. So the same concept we hear talked about with the the rut is timed the way that it is to flood the spring with fawns all at the same time. It's the same thing with cold. Exactly. Same thing. You know, um, yeah, I know you're from Indiana, but you've probably seen the videos of the sea turtles. I mean, they mm -hmm. all have the timed hatch. Yeah. And then they they just make the march and then they're trying to get past. They're running the gauntlet. Yeah. Well, by having precisely timed hatches all about the same time. And you've got a lot, that's why you're getting 12 eggs, 10 to 12 eggs per, we're not supposed to get 10 or 12 holts per hen. Right. We're, we need about two to three. Two is going to make it a stable population. And if you get above two, it typically will increase your population. Gotcha. What about, so roosting habitat, what's where turkeys want to roost. What's the, what's the best thing you can do? Cause obviously if you can roost them on your property, you're better shape than if you're trying to, you know, get, turkeys moving through the course of the day so if i want somebody to roost on my my property as opposed to my neighbors what am i going to do to help support uh, turkeys picking my woodlot well one is and, and unfortunately we don't have a lot of influence in this is you need to have old mature trees yeah. you know and so those are something that's going to take time but by having you know if you do have old mature trees make sure that underneath those trees it's open because if it's a densely kind of understory underneath those, turkeys, it, if you've ever watched a turkey fly to roost, they're not very graceful about it. I mean, they they're banging not, off a limb. They are not. They're banging off the limbs and they're knocking limbs off the trees. And they, you know, they're, it's not very graceful. So they need some runway. They need an opportunity to get into that roost tree. So if you've got these huge majestic oak trees that are great for roosting, but you've got a dense understory underneath it and no, no runway for them to get to those trees, you're going to reduce your ability for those birds to, to roost there. So that's, a, that's probably the easiest because we can't grow trees any bigger or any faster. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've been on some people, they're like, man, these birds move off my property to roost. And it's like all the trees are 15, 20 feet tall. And it's like, well, those limbs aren't big enough yet to, to do that. Just give them time to keep managing and, you know, turkeys on average use about 1,500 to 2,000 acres in a given year. So they're going to be off of your property. And, mm -hmm. but if you can create, you know, the need for their nesting habitat, that's probably more important in the spring because that's where the hens are going to be. No, it makes sense. It makes sense for sure. So is, is that what's most overlooked then? Is that that nesting habitat? Is that where people are missed? If there's, if you could narrow it down, obviously it's all over the place, but if you could narrow it down where you have to have this conversation more often than the rest about what people are missing as they're trying to manage for, for turkeys, is that what it is? It is. I, I think it's the distribution of nesting habitat on their property. And then it's also the, having the enough open understory yeah. for these. 
and it, you know, it, and so it does. That is one of those places where it kind of flies in the face, of, you know, because every when it comes to deer, you talk about having a sanctuary. You just you want to have that sanctuary area that it's five or ten percent of your property, and you're not going there. And I think that some guys are taking the same approach to that nesting area concept, and it's it, they don't have eight sanctuaries that equal five or ten percent of their property. They've got one spot that encompasses all of it and they kind of know where not to go and then that's kind of turning around and doing the same thing yeah so again i think it's just i think it's that equal distribution or that stratified distribution of um, nesting habitat on the on their land and then also probably probably some of the woods are way too thick yeah. you know that makes sense so I, I want to make sure, and I, I kind of gave you a heads up before we started talking, I wanted to spend some time on this too, is, you know, obviously habitat plays, plays a big role because if you don't have habitat, you can't support the population. Um, but it's a discussion I've been having with some folks here lately. And, and just anecdotally, what I'm seeing um, is we got fur prices that are as low as they've ever mm -hmm. been. We've got you know, when I was growing up, you still had, you know, a lot of farmers, a lot of folks in the country that still ran hounds for coons. And that was still a thing. And that's, that seems like it's all but disappeared, at least in my area. Uh, and, and just with the expense of, you know, gas prices higher than they ever were, you've got fewer people that are out partaking in the hunting of these fur bears. And I, I had a picture on one of my properties a couple of years ago, 14 raccoons at one time on one walnut tree. <laughs> that, I, that I could see in yeah. frame and that's I mean and at the time you know you're just kind of pissy because all great 14 raccoons in the tree but you move that forward and, you know this was a picture that was taken in October but that's a real problem when we start looking at May and June when there's nests and poults on the ground and that kind of thing so you know habitat is getting a lot of the attention but but how much is that that nest predator pressure putting on the birds right now? Is that is that just something that's anecdotal to me, or is that something that is a, a larger concern, kind of across turkey locations? Yeah, so we that's probably the number one one of the top two or three questions I get on a on a pretty weekly basis is okay we've got to we've got to control the predators. <clears throat> well. You know, I think we've got to look at it in a, in a little bit more equitability that, as we just talked about, you know, turkeys are made to um, survive predation. You mm -hmm. know, that they've evolved with predators. Um, now, it potentially is compounded by a lack of fur prices. We don't have as many people partaking in trapping as they once did. We have probably, we don't have the nesting habitat as healthy as we once did and it's not equally distributed as it once was because we just don't have the active management going mm -hmm. on the landscape so yes predation there's no doubt that raccoons and skunks and possums even coyotes everybody thinks coyotes are the cause for lower turkey populations coyotes are really have you ever seen a dog try to catch a bird they're not really good at it <laughs> and so most of the time what occurs is coyotes and these other animals stumble upon a nest and then they take advantage of it they're they're not going to pass up a meal but most of the time they're not going out and and trying to find these birds you know with a single single focus but when we have you compound that with low quality habitat yeah with variable or unfavorable weather conditions and you know growing up in indiana you probably rabbit hunted you probably mm -hmm. quail hunted you know maybe a little bit but when did you put the birds when did you put your beagles on the ground after a rain mm -hmm. because the scent was there the dogs could pick it up better so when you have favorable unfavorable weather conditions you have it you know un you know, maybe a small area of nesting habitat, we are stacking the deck against, against the birds for against the birds. Now, I would encourage everybody to take advantage of the trapping seasons in there, but you have to do so recognizing that trapping alone is not going not to gonna. solve your problem. No. You know, you've got to have favorable weather conditions. You need to have uh, equal distribution of nesting habitat 
hard mass for the winter. You need the other components that turkeys need, and they can withstand the predation. Mm -hmm. But you can't go in and put all your resources into predation because what you do is you create these sinks and other predators move in because you know they're only going to be able to have so many predators over here. You create a sink here, they're going to move in pretty quickly. So they backfill. And so predation does occur. Is it is it the silver bullet of what we're seeing with the un the health of the diminishing turkey population? Probably not. But can you should you take advantage of the resources and the trapping opportunities within your states by far? Go do it. Learn how to put learn how to figure out how to put that raccoon's foot in a six by six spot on the ground. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty cool trick to be able to figure out. Mm -hmm. You know, so but predators alone are not where are not causing where we're at today right yeah well and you know like i said same with same with the habitat is, but like you said now we're not we're not taking one thing and working it against the birds we start stacking two and three of those things up against them and then then it gets a lot tougher to to try to manage our way around it i think i think another thing that probably feeds into that is just how so many so many folks are whether they own the land or they're just hunting it they're working with such smaller parcels that mm -hmm. it gets you know it gets way tougher managing a thousand acres is easy because you got room to do whatever you want to do managing 10 acres and trying to maximize that how do you break that mm -hmm. up and when when you can't affect your neighbor's nesting you know it's tough to checkerboard 10 acres so how do it you, is, you know. how, how do you go about trying to do all that you can do? And, and I think, uh, yeah, it, it gets really complicated really quick trying to make sure you're doing everything that you can on those small parcels, especially. Yeah. Access and people don't think about access in this manner, but land ownership patterns definitely influence management of wild turkeys and even deer because and I'll try to break this down to really simple. So if you had a landowner that was a thousand, owned a thousand acres, right? And let's say the birds that were being harvested, you kill one bird per hunter. That landowner is going to go in and kill his one bird. Now you break that into 10 different ownerships, hundred acres of peach, which is still a sizable chunk of land for somebody to own. Mm -hmm. But now you, all of a sudden you have 10 hunters all winning to kill that one bird. Mm -hmm. So that gets into the, to the aspect that you want to ensure that we give the social support for the state wildlife agencies to create season structures that align with nesting, nesting, initi nesting initiation and when these birds are on nest to maximize harvest. Because if we have birds being harvested before the season, before nest initiation starts, that is potentially, and I will say the word potentially, because we don't know exactly yet, influencing the nest nesting attempts and overall uh, the number of hens that are sitting on nest because we're going in there and disturbing them. We don't know what that relationship is today. But think about it. If one landowner that had killed one bird off a thousand, now you've got 10 landowners wanting to kill a bird off their own bird off of their hundred acres which is kind of what our ultimate goal is, is especially people who live in the East. They want their little slice of heaven and they're going to kill their bird. Well, then that thousand, thousand acres went from one bird harvested to 10 birds harvested. That's an impact, but it's not an impact if we have seasons set properly based on nest initiation within the states that they're in. And with that's mean? the support back to the state wildlife agencies. So, is that part of that research, you know, that some of that ongoing research that's needed is some of that more state specific, really honing in on when are we seeing peak, peak nest initiation so that we can try to make sure we're staying out of the woods at that time so that those, those hens have that comfort? Yeah, so there's, a, there's been a study in South Carolina, South Carolina DNR, um, that looked at nesting initiation within this, across the state of South Carolina. We're doing some goblin chronology work in North Carolina, and then we're, we're fully engaged with um, Michael Chamberlain with the UGA, University of Georgia in Athens, um, on, on potential other research. So 
we're getting ready to launch a request for proposals that are going to be sent out through our technical committee that's trying to figure this out because we know we have, as a hunter, we have a relationship with turkeys, but we have to figure out how are we influencing it left or right um, to ensure that we're not inadvertently harvesting birds too early or we're impacting things too late. Now, the noise in the system probably wasn't there when we were growing and the population was close to 7 million. But now that it's kind of stabilized, and I use the word stabilized because in the past 15 years, turkey populations have gone down about 10 to 15 percent. We know that. We still have a ton of birds on the landscape. I mean, we're over 6 million. When we were founded as an organization, we had 1.3 million. So we're still doing really, really well. Mm -hmm. But for us to maximize that, we need to create opportunities for agencies to adjust to harvest because that's the only thing that they can, that's the only thing they can adjust. And we need to find that happy medium of maximizing opportunities, but not influencing in a negative fashion, turkey reproduction. Well, and it, it's, it's been incredible to see, again, I'm, I'm in Indiana and I, you never saw turkeys when I was young. You know, when I first started deer hunting, you you never saw turkeys in this part of the state of Indiana. It just it it did not happen, and they've they've kind of started creeping in. And and here in the northeast corner, it's still I I always say it's a kind of a Swiss cheese population. You've got some properties that you know they're they're taking off, and you know hunters could probably kill three gobblers a piece, and you wouldn't make a dent for years. And you go two miles up the road. And you could sit there and call for a month and never see the first bird. It's still, it's still kind of sporadic, but it's not, you know, as recently, even as 10 or 15 years ago, like you saw, you saw a turkey and you talked about it for a week to everybody that you saw because yeah. it was just that infrequent that you saw them. And now, you know, every, you see them all the time. They show up on the trail cameras. They're, they're definitely around. So it's, it's been great to, great to see the rebound, um, but it's you know even even here where we still have a, a pretty robust population it's there's definitely still a lot of places that are not not carrying the birds that they could on the ground right you know and, and some of that takes time you know what we've seen in turkeys with the peak in their population and then kind of that little bit of a regress is a pretty natural phenomenon in, in wildlife they they outpace where they're going and then mm -hmm. they kind of come back down to, to where the reality is. So, again, turkey populations, I don't think anybody will argue, are where they were at 15 years ago, the health of the population. But we are still very, very healthy. But we've got additional, we know that there's new challenges. We never thought about landowner demographics and land ownership patterns when we were doing restoration that much. We never talked about hey, we had all these birds. We were seeing birds four or five poults per hen on recruitment. Now we're getting down to below two and we're like, oh, okay, this is different. Mm -hmm. So we need to conduct the necessary research. We need to evaluate new things. And we need the ability from a hunter's perspective. And oftentimes these are controversial. People are pushing back against agencies to adjust season structures. But we these guys are trained wildlife biologists. Most of them were turkey hunters before they ever became state biologists to oversee turkeys. Mm -hmm. That they want turkey populations to be as healthy as they can be. They're not anybody, and, and I work hand in hand with every state turkey coordinator in the country that sit on our, sits on our technical committee. And so they're, they think about this every single day is what's going on? How can we maximize this? And they're trying to do that within the only lever that they can pull, and that's adjusting harvest structure and season structure. Because they can't change the weather. They can't change your habitat. They can't, you know, in, you know they, they can provide opportunities for trapping. They can't recruit new hunters, but they can adjust season structures. And we need to give them the leeway to do so if they feel it is important. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. So kind of kind of start to wrap it up here a little bit and uh, so first of all where can people find out more information about help to yelp where can they go to get involved where can they go to to help help 
that program? Yeah, so we've got a couple of things. We're nwtf.org is a website that we've got, www.nwtf.org. It's actually getting a facelift here in the next probably three to four weeks. Um, it's going to be fresh. It's going to be leading with the mission. It's going to be, and so there's going to be a lot of tools there for you. They're going to be able to go in there and find uh, kind of entry points for their local communities on their events that are women in outdoors, Jake's, which is our youth program, our wheel and sportsman events, or our fundraising events. And that's in the local communities, grassroots led. So I'd encourage people to start there. On our website, we will have information on the Help the Yelp project. And then it's also, you know, engaging, you know, through that website, there's going to be information in there about what we do, how we do it, you know, not only in your neck of the woods or in their back backyard, but how are those smaller activities tied to the larger needs across for their state, region, and nationally? Perfect. I appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time. I, I think there's a lot of good information in there. Um, you know, it's like I said, it's, I think the trap, I, at, at least as I see it, uh, I think the trap we get caught in a lot of time is we, we look at deer management and we assume that that's land management in general. And I, I don't know that we're necessarily always serving, serving everything that we want to be serving by, by going about it that way. And I think there was some really good information that we can all adjust uh, kind of how we're, how we're trying to support our, our native species uh, with that. So I appreciate you taking the time today. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here. Thanks for your all support. And I hope everybody has a great, safe spring. Very much the same. Thanks for joining again. Again, wherever you're listening to the podcast, I invite you to rate, review, subscribe, and uh, definitely go follow Spy Point, follow NWTF, and, and get involved with, with making sure that we're recruiting birds for the future and hunters for the future and keeping everybody engaged. Thanks, everybody.